the first question I guess before I even speak to Ron Noble is why is he here? Why, why did I invite him in the first place? Because this is after all a conference, a summit on sport and business. That's the reason, because to me, at the end of this long road, the, the marriage between sport and business, there is no business down the end of the road if we allow sport to become so corrupted that people can't believe in its credibility. And I think the, the very place we're in, Istanbul at this moment, with half the, the football hierarchy locked up or at least facing <coughs> some kind of trial, that sort of puts us right in, in the mouth of where, where we're at. But <coughs> to introduce Ron Noble, if it's necessary, <coughs> he, is, he was a chief prosecutor for the American government in real crime. And, you know, we're talking mafia, we're talking terrorism, we're talking everything. So when we first introduced one another, I said to him, well, where does sport come on this priority? How, how does sport gain your attention? After having a din dinner with him, I knew where. The guy is a sports fan, like I would imagine at least two thirds of the people in the room, even if we're here for business, even if it's a job. Sport is so compelling, and anyone who saw Chelsea steal the game from Barcelona last night will know what I mean. So really, without much more ado, except to say that, in case you don't know, Ron Noble has been for 11 years Secretary General, which is effectively the Chief Officer of Inter Interpol, which is the International Police Force Liaison with police forces in 190 countries around the world. So I doubt that we could have a, a better guest to discuss the situation we're talking about now. So could, could I interrupt and just uh, confess my bias right now? Um, two biases. Uh, I'm half German. The first World Cup match I remember seeing as a child was the best World Cup match in 1974 when Germany won. And in terms of team sports, as my son says, if you're my father, then my team is your team. So I think the match last night was a great match. I'm a Real Madrid fan, and so I think it was, <laughs> I think it was fairly played, fairly played. Other than those two comments, I'm going to give you really an independent, honest perspective <laughs> from the seat of... It could, be get, it could be getting his comeuppance tonight, because as a matter of fact, it's not sport and corruption, but it's a very strange sport that runs itself in the way that the Spanish league does. It has two teams which from the beginning of the season, it was obvious they would be semi-finalists and probably finalists in the <coughs> Champions League. And what did they do? They managed to schedule them so that on Saturday, midway between the home and away legs in the European semi-finals, they're playing the Clasico to see who wins the tournament in Spain. So the, there was a measure of tiredness last night. You can guess my bias is the other club. To, to the one we're talking about. <clears throat> but it, it is strange that with all the money invested, and we're talking billions and billions of dollars, that a, a national league should organize itself so badly that their two top teams are at the mercy of the other clubs, which each could rest eight of their 11 players in their weekend matches. So his son, who's 11 years old, could be having a tough night tonight. We'll see. <clears throat> we'll see. You can but guess. The great, thing, the great thing from my perspective about last night's match is that there was no talk of, until, until now, there was no talk of the result being anything other than a result based on the merits. The best team won, or the better team, I should say, won last night. I also um, come from Lyon now, Lyon, France, where Interpol's headquartered. And uh, a few months ago, it was a match between Lyon and uh, Dynamo Zagreb, I believe, where Lyon won seven to one. Seven to one. After having not scored a goal in the previous three matches. And, and afterwards, the feeling of many, and an article written by you, made us all question whether the result was a great result, which is based on the great athleticism and the commitment of the Lyon team, or whether it was based on corruption. I believe that's the real problem that corruption in sports brings to us is that we can't have confidence that a great result 
um, is in fact a great result. We ask ourselves, I wonder whether in fact it was a result based on the merit or based on something else. You can guess that we know each other quite well and I don't intend this to be a rigid interview. This will be a discussion between the two and we'll go where it leads. <clears throat> but I will start by saying, Ron, during the World Cup two years ago, what was the scale of corruption that your officers were investigating? For, I'm asked frequently, what is the sort of scope of the illegal betting problem in football or in sports generally? And you can read numbers that say anywhere from 90 billion a year to Chris Eaton, a former colleague, has said up to 500 billion a year. For me, it's hard to project the scope globally, except to say it's huge. And to give you some concrete examples, drawing on the question that Rob just asked me. For the uh, World Cup, 2010, during four weeks, Interpol organized a joint operation with six countries in Southeast Asia. Okay? Four weeks. And in those four weeks, there were over 5,000 arrests, 5,000 arrests. 5,000 arrests in the, in the six countries, 2,000 raids, and over hundreds of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions of dollars in illegal betting. We did those operations three times since 2007. Since 2007, we've had three operations where the arrests alone were almost 7,000, almost 7,000, more than 2,000 raids, and illegal bets seized and the amount of 2.239 billion euros. That's six countries, three operations, a total of 12 weeks, to give you an idea of how large a problem it is. Once you take <clears throat> the head criminals of these syndicates out of commission, how soon is it before the problem mushrooms itself and reinvents itself? You know, the parallel between illegal sports betting and drug trafficking is very, very strong. Unfortunately, when these arrests and raids occur, typically it's the people in the lower rungs who are arrested. And the goal is you arrest them, you get them to cooperate, or you convict them at trial, and then you ask them to give you information about the people higher up. So when I say 6,000, almost 7,000 arrests and three operations, for the most part, low-level people or people operating small gambling dens, and we're still moving up the chain, to get to the transnational organized crime figures behind and is, is it a question of arrest? I mean, if you get a gang that's organized <clears throat> criminality at such an event as the World Cup, if, if you can put that gang into jail, or not you, because the one thing that I think not too many people understand is that Interpol doesn't actually arrest anybody. Interpol is like a liaison between police forces, gives the police forces the information. I've been to <clears throat> Lyon, to the headquarters there, and it's, it's as though you're walking into the future. There's a room maybe this big, full of consoles with people who are multilinguists, looking at this information as it comes in. This is not sports fraud they're looking at. They're looking at everything from millions of or stolen or lost passports to, and you can imagine again what this means for the upcoming Olympics, because if England or London has a problem with the Olympics, and if the problem is who's coming in, then somebody has to have a database to stop those people coming in. And even the police forces that I've spoken to around the world are not that willing and not that ready to plug into Ron's database in Lyon. Yeah. Well, I mean, your, your question raises a, a good point, and that is who's behind a lot of this illegal gambling and sports betting that occurs? Most of us have friends or family members who've made bets on important sporting matches, not even knowing whether they're legal bets or illegal bets, but they've made bets on matches. But what most people don't understand is a lot of these transnational organized crime groups that organize these betting operations, they organize the collection of bets, the losing bets. And the collection techniques um, tend to really follow a lot of the collection techniques that you will see in the movies either threats of harm or physical harm or threats of harm or physical harm to loved ones. So when Interpol gets focused on these operations, you know, we, we have to make arrests, we have to conduct raids, 
But our goal is to get up the chain to take down these transnational organized crime groups that are preparing themselves for the Olympics, that are preparing themselves for the, are already participating in the Champions League, and that, that are really not innocent groups of people just trying to allow other innocent groups of people to make a bet. And then something you said to me <coughs> when I first visited Leon is, this is 24-7 that, that you work, but when you arrived at Interpol only 11 years ago, it was like nine to four, and everybody put their raincoats on and went home. And what kind of staff around the world can you organize to, to try to beat organized crime? Uh, organized sporting crime, since yeah. that's where we're. For, for us um, at Interpol, we, we try to do things in very basic ways, but to do sort of basic or ordinary things in extraordinary ways. So when you ask how do we try to fight um, a crime like this, we, we recognize that all international crime is really local crime somewhere. There is some community where there's someone engaged in criminal conduct or encouraging criminal conduct or hurting people or threatening to hurt people. And what you try to do is, is mobilize the police in those countries and the civil society in those countries to care. And the only way to, to get them to care is to have it become emotional in some way, have them be able to identify to some wrong that was done to a friend of theirs or even to their favorite team because of passion for sports that many of us feel, even those of us who are introduced as lovers of sports and at one time remember ourselves as athletes, um, that, that uh, it really, really matters at the local I should level. Say this, this guy was in the gym at seven o'clock this morning. Yeah. 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 What, <clears throat> when you're working your, at your side, how can you continue to love sport if you see the, the level of corruption that infiltrates itself? The, 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 the level of corruption in sports, I don't believe, is significant in a quantifiable way in terms of percentage of matches that are allegedly fixed or even suspicious. I don't believe that. The problem is that sport is such a pure activity for many of us, spectators and athletes, that even when that small percentage, the 1% or 2%, gets focused on or has a spotlight on it, it makes us just lose confidence in any match. And that's the point that I, I try to make about fighting you know, corruption or fighting terrorism, that it, it's the one event or two events or the huge event when it occurs, then afterwards you don't know what to believe anymore. And I know that if I were to say it's a $90 billion a year problem or a $100 billion a year problem or $300 billion a year problem, people could quibble with me, but no one can argue that when there's a, when corruption is unveiled in some match, that it affects all matches and, and often all sports. And I can still love it because I believe that most of the athletes who train their entire lives or their trainers or managers and, and fans, they believe in the purity of the sport. And that's why Interpol <clears throat> wants to work with you know, civil society and law enforcement around the world to make it more costly a greater risk to engage in this criminal conduct. So to keep those of us who love the purity of sport believing that what we see on TV or are on the pitch in fact really happened. But one, th one thing that sports writers like me and certainly your officers that I've spoken to find that money isn't always the problem. In other words, sports people who are earning a lot of money, you would think if you've got a, a millionaire sportsman, someone earning $10 million a year, he's not gonna be corruptible to sell the sport that he loves, quotes, end quote. And my view is most of them don't, but there is another problem, the problem of entrapment or the honey trap, you know, which, which you can explain, Ron. Yeah, I want to just, before explaining that, I want, to, I want to talk to you about the challenge from a law enforcement perspective. So let's say we're a lover of a sport, we have maybe an amateur's knowledge of the sport, but generally we think when we, we, we believe, we feel that we know when something is suspicious or doesn't look right. We, we, we believe that we know that. And then we can count on experts like you to write articles to re reinforce our opinion or to say, no, no, this happened because of reason A or reason B or reason C. The problem is when something suspicious or unusual happens today, you'll have one of the league heads, president or spokesperson say, no, we've checked all legal 
gambling sites, and there has been no unusual betting activity. Therefore, we conclude there was no corruption in the match. And from Interpol's perspective, or from police perspectives, or from a prosecutor's perspective, the motivation for why someone does something other than what the, the game would require can be many fold. And the challenge for us in law enforcement and for civil society and for you as sports writers is to figure out what can we do as a society when something happens that raises our suspicion to make sure that it is exhaustively examined but quickly examined and then allow us to know whether or not we have a wider problem rather than a smaller problem. One, I want to say this especially because I'm in Turkey. One point that is absolutely clear, and you have to trust me on this, I've been in law enforcement now for almost 30 years, that just because you don't have an investigation of corruption does not mean that you have a clean sport or a country where no corruption occurs. Some of the worst of corruption occurs in countries where there's never an investigation of, corrup of corruption. So my view is the fact that you have aggressive investigations, that you expose it, that people are held accountable, means that you have a chance of cleaning it up. If you cover it up, or sweep it under the table, the likelihood is that the problem's gonna blow up and the moment might arrive when people have absolutely no confidence. But I, I feel that the very game that you already alluded to, Leon versus Zagreb, or it was in Zagreb, <clears throat> and I, as you say, I wrote the story with suspicion, but no further than that, because I don't have any concrete evidence that that, that was corrupt, but it sure looked it. And <clears throat> I obviously spoke to UEFA right to the very top. And UEFA's chief official, Michel Platini, has already said that corruption is the thing that could kill sport or certainly kill organized football on his level. So I said to him, what investigation are you going to hold? And he said, well, we don't have any evidence leading towards investigation. My point was sport has to be like Caesar's wife. It has to be above suspicion. So if something as suspect as that happens, as Ron said, this is a team, Leon, that hadn't scored a goal, or maybe they'd scored one goal per game. They'd scraped through. On that night, they needed seven goals, or they needed a seven-goal margin to stop Ajax from getting in through to the next round. <clears throat> and lo and behold, they achieved seven goals. Now that, to me, it, it's not that I want to, to look at the sport that I write so much about and find corruption. But it stares you in the face that, that you have to, at least from the top level, employ the police forces to which FIFA are now paying a lot of money to, to Interpol to, to organize education, at least, on this level. <clears throat> and Can I just uh, interrupt yeah. for one second? Generally, my security detail tries to protect me from terrorists or transnational organized criminals. Or, or journalists. <laughs> But when I, when I just raise the question about the Leon match, and, and I want to make this clear, I'm just raising the question. I'm saying, what can society do when something unusual or even suspicious happens to make people understand whether it was just unusual or just looked suspicious, but wasn't anything, or in fact, something criminal happened? I, I just raise a question. And for me, the security level required on me to return back to Interpol headquarters just to get me inside the complex without the Leon supporters ripping my arms out of my sockets was huge. And so what I want to say is, and also a few weeks later, Barcelona beat a team 7-1. No one raised the question. So it's not the 7-1 in Lyon or 7-1 in Barcelona. It's when you fans or experts see something that's unusual. And when we know that the risk of corrupt influence is great, what can we do as a society to assure ourselves that we've done all we can to keep the sport clean. And that's what we're <clears throat> trying to work Let towards. Let me just say there that <clears throat> Barcelona 7 certainly wasn't corrupt. That was genius. Le Lionel Messi scored five goals. I mean, that was... I I'm just feeling that you and you're it beat, a Barcelona it, fan. It beat I mean, a German just, team on just the way. a Barcelona fan. <clears throat> if Barcelona does it, it can't be corrupt. If Real Madrid does it, possibly. Maybe last night was corrupt. No, yeah. no. <clears throat> the, the thing that both of us agreed before... We, we set out on this, and before I wrote something in <clears throat> the newspaper today, well, it can sound terribly sinister. And in fact, <clears throat> I've sat in court during a case that was sinister. Two Chinese students were murdered in Newcastle, England, because of their involvement at a really, really low level of soccer. They were watching 
football off the radar, but it was being filmed and televised to um, China. And there was a one, one and a half minute time delay in the transmission. And people were betting on this in China. And these people were brutally rubbed out. And when the killer was apprehended and taken <coughs> to court, he just simply refused to say who in China were his masters and who was detailing this. That, to me, is where something like Interpol has, has its biggest role, because there's no way that an English police force is going to get their foot across the threshold of organized crime in China. Yeah, and, and for, you know, for investigators, and I, just, I, I want to keep going back to this point, drawing parallels between corruption in sports and other criminal conduct that I've been investigating for, for most of my life. In the area of money laundering, there was a rule passed that said if you deposit a certain amount of money or engage in a certain amount of transactions in your bank, the banker had an obligation and has an obligation to report you if he or she believed your conduct was suspicious. And for bankers who knew their customers and clients, it was difficult to sort of say, I'm now going to accuse and open a record and send it to the government accusing my client or neighbor of suspicious transaction. So we came up with a rule or an approach to say, it can be unusual or suspicious. You don't need to taint someone and say it's suspicious. And with the Leon match, what I was trying to do is to say that it was unusual for most of us, suspicious for some of us, what should we do? At Interpol, we know that the bets can occur halfway around the world. We know that with the internet, that there are bets that don't even affect the outcome, right? Which side has the first throw in, the first corner kick, free kick, et cetera. And the only way that we believe ultimately to do it is to make sure that you're in a community where either the fans, the athletes, the trainers, the officials, civil society feel that they can disclose to someone something they know that happened. And from that bit of information, you can conduct an investigation and determine what happened. But there has to be some way beyond the leagues themselves that we as a civil society say we're going to investigate it because the amount of money at stake is huge. <clears throat> are you uneasy? Uh, I mean, maybe it is my suspicious journalistic nature, but are you uneasy about the level to which top clubs, Real Madrid, if I dare mention it, wear on their vests advertising for internet betting? Because the, the, the whole of sport now seems to be so much in bed with, with betting as an organization that is it any surprise then that they're squealing that you know corruptors have, have spoiled their their beautiful game? I hope I'll have a job after I answer this question, <laughs> but I don't see anything wrong with legal betting, and I believe that legal betting challenges activity in a way that it can be re regulated. So the fact that a team is wearing something saying bet legally, uh, I would encourage that kind of. Activity. But it's different in the States. You know, a lot of things are different. I mean, a lot of things are different in the U.S. Um, in, in the U.S., um, if I might say so, I hope this is accurate, there are some states or some geographic locations that have monopolies or close to monopolies on gambling. Um, but in the U.S., there are many, many, many legal ways to bet. But we're a diverse world. Interpol has 190 member countries, and that's another problem I just want to highlight for you. Imagine you have a large, large, large bet on a match. And the match says, you know, you're going to win so long as the aggregate score uh, isn't more than four goals scored. And let's say by the first half, it's 3-2. And if the game finishes the way it's going, you're going to lose your money. But imagine you can stop the match. You can talk about examples from the UK. You can stop the match and not pay anything. The influence or encouragement for you to stop the match would be great. Imagine you're now in another jurisdiction where once you reach halftime, the bets are paid out. So one of the, one of the problems that exists, and it's just going to be there around, is you've got in, incoherent rules affecting when bets are paid and when bets are not paid. It's not going to change, but at least by being aware of it, if suddenly the lights go out in a stadium or something unusual happens and a match is stopped, then you can understand, let's look in this betting jurisdiction 
where if something happens before the halftime or at a certain point, the match, all bets are cut off, called off, or if it continues. And that's why you can't use one country as an example. You can't have the best law enforcement agency in one country or the best team in one country because there are people all over the world finding creative ways to encourage sometimes innocent athletes to say, you know, my friend and I uh, have this bet, this friendly bet that the first, cor the first corner is going to come from um, the other team. Can you make it happen? You know, just we'll laugh about it afterwards. I mean, things like that happen. It sounds, you might think that it sounds naive, but it happens. And people do it for friends or for family members whom they trust. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of money um, at stake. So that's why you know, Interpol's approach when we entered into this agreement with FIFA was to say, you know, we're good at uh, investigating people and helping our member countries investigate. We're good at tracking down criminals wherever they go internationally, but we want to be better at helping crime be prevented in sports where once it happens, once the bad taste is on your mouth, you can never remove it. Let me, <clears throat> let me just explain the contract that, that Ron is talking about here, because FIFA, which I guess everybody in the room knows has its own problems with its image, which is far from above corruption itself, another form of corruption. But FIFA has entered... Rob, Rob told me this was going to be a friendly discussion. So far, okay, so just far a friendly is. discussion in front of friends. Go ahead, please. please. So far, so please. far Continue. it is. Continue. But I, I was just going to say, let us explain what your agreement is with FIFA. Because it, it is actually an educational um, plan that, that Interpol is putting into play. I'll tell you how it happened. Um, we monitor the internet in a variety of languages on a daily basis, looking for usually terrorist-related activity or, or suspicious activity. And we learned about the scandal that was surrounding FIFA. The sense was that there was corruption um, within FIFA, within the sport, and not enough was being done to combat it. So the former head of Interpol's Command and Coordination Center, a 24-7 operation, an Australian police officer um, had just been hired by FIFA to be the head of security. So I contacted him and I said, listen, Interpol's prepared to try to develop a training capacity building program for civil society and for law enforcement around the world on the condition that you give us the money and we decide how to spend it. And uh, we had discussions with FIFA Secretary General and FIFA President and, and they agreed to it. And that's the agreement we have now, is where we're in the process of building, it's over a 10-year period, a comprehensive program to try to teach people about how corrupt activities occur, to try to educate a lot of these young athletes at various levels, and managers and officials, and to do it you know, by training in, on location, around events, uh, e-learning, in academic institutions, wherever we can. But to and treat it as a long-term problem that unless you pay attention to it over a long period of time, it's going to you know, leap up one day and, and really shock you. And how deliberate is it that that complex is going to be based in Singapore, which is obviously Asia, and, and Asia is perceived as part of the genesis of the problems of illegal gambling? When Interpol is building a global complex in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, Historically, since we were born, we've been in Europe, and since 1946, we've been in France, where we have our headquarters in France. But so much activity, legal and illegal activity, is now going on in the rest of the world, and Interpol believed that it should have more than one axis or more than one global complex. So we decided to build a complex in Singapore. Sports, corruption in sports, integrity in sports was not foremost in our mind. It was where could we be located, where there's a a great infrastructure where the corruption was low in the country, where we could fly in and fly out very easily, where the government would support an independent and neutral Interpol, and Singapore surfaced. Afterwards, afterwards, these stories where my former colleagues said that uh, Singapore was the academy of corruption or academy of corruption in football uh, uh, in the world. So now it, it's great that we're there because we're going to we're going to put the uh, the capacity building and training uh, unit there, and it's going to be a FIFA-supported area, and there's going to be a lot of business 
um, in that part of the world to try to fight corruption, but that wasn't the plan initially. When, <clears throat> when this whole thing starts, obviously you've got this contract. It's 20 million euros over 10 years. Which is, which is little. But that, that's FIFA, FIFA's right. contribution. Right. What about other sports? Have you got across the threshold of cricket with the, with the obvious problems that cricket's having right now? Even sumo wrestling? Yes, yes. My mother says in my work, I don't have to worry about a job because there's always some work to do. Um, but uh, we've already met with the International Cricket Council um, to talk about collaboration we can do. They actually have a very, very good training program there that Interpol can learn from. So we've already met with them. I've, I've not, uh, I'm going to Japan in a couple of weeks. I've not thought about the Sumo Wrestling Organization, but that's a, that's a possibility. Our program is broader than football. It's an integrity in sports program. But one thing that Interpol generally believes, it's the local law enforcement, the local community knows best how to investigate crime for, or, or keep people safe. If you want to find the best way to secure a football match, Turkey. The police in Turkey, the citizens of Turkey, the private security in Turkey, they have one of the best operations in the world in terms of how to secure um, a stadium um, for a match. It's my opinion as Interpol Secretary General. In terms of these other sports, if you mentioned the Olympics, you know, we're, we're, we're just building relationships and networks to make sure that we learn the best practices in various sports in terms of how to help all of us keep sport generally clean. The, <clears throat> this, I mean, one, one thing that I was wondering, if we could have a show of hands on this, how many people in the room would do business with sport if sport was, was seen to be clean? Or how, I should put it the other That's way. That's a tough question. I mean, ask, ask it the other way ask, around. How many ask, people would not if they thought that sport, you know, that they couldn't trust what they're investing in? Because to me, maybe I'm naive, but if I was running an international business, I wouldn't really want to touch sport if I thought that the result was a foregone conclusion right. and somebody was making a lot of money out of corrupting it in the first place. Otherwise, what, what uh, we're talking about here doesn't matter. May I ask you a question, please? If, if it's under the rules, may I ask you a question? Is, that, is it ethical? Yeah. <laughs> is it ethical? No, but is there a, without saying what the sport is, is there a sport you can think of where you as a sports writer have lost confidence in the outcome on the pitch or the track, wherever it might occur, where you believe that sport is so corrupt that I as a sports writer have no confidence in the outcome? Don't name a sport, but is there a sport like that? That you can think of? I will name a sport because other, other journalists have done the work. Cricket, after the Pakistan-England cricket series of last summer, or the summer before now, that was, it was, the operation was not something that I as a journalist approved of. It was a sting operation to, to entrap the people who were, who were placing the bets. So to me, that's not ethical journalism, although it's a means to an end. But what it did prove was it is just that easy to, to corrupt a sport right at the very top level. And, you know, cricket is religion in Pakistan. But you wouldn't say every cricket match um, no, is but a match you, that you lose. You might say there's a chance for it. You wouldn't say cricket is corrupt from top to bottom. You wouldn't say that, would you? Please say no. To, well, to me, you want to be sure that if you want to be sure that was a one off. And it wasn't a one-off. You know, more comes out of the woodwork once you start that. From the policing perspective, it's not cricket. From the international policing perspective, it's not cricket. There could be a match that's corrupt just like in football, but the passion in cricket, country to country, is so strong that there's not a price you can pay some athletes to throw a particular we, match. We two have reversed roles here, and we shouldn't have done, because I'm, I'm a lover of sport, and, and I don't want to think that anything I see is corrupt. Otherwise, what, what would be the point of me going along to a game and thinking I'm, you know, I'm well-versed to judge what's going to happen in the next 90 minutes, and then the opposite happens? I don't want to walk away from that event and say, I got that completely wrong because it was crooked. I mean, that's, that's the complete opposite to the, to the way I believe life should be. But in and, law enforcement, there's a sport where if you ask most law enforcement officers around the world, um, is this sport corrupt? And can you imagine person X or person Y or person Z having won because they doped themselves up? Most of us would say 
We know the sport. I know what we're talking about. We know the sport. <clears throat> and I'll and say it even if Ron won't, because he lives in France. It's, <laughs> it's the Tour de France. Yes. And, <clears throat> you know, to me, I've covered the Tour de France. And the Tour de France is almost an inhuman activity. You know, they're doing 3,000 kilometers in 30 days. It's almost beyond human capacity to do it at the pace they're doing it. And I've said, and I'm sure many people before me have said, well, why don't you lower the tariff? Why don't you ask sportsmen to do something that's within human capability? Because I, I, I haven't got the figures in front of me, but we're talking of two thirds of the winners of the Tour de France, either corrupted through taking um, contaminants or under suspicion. Ron and I spoke at lunch today about um, his countryman, someone I have got to know quite well, Lance Armstrong. That guy is a huge example for people around the world who are suffering from cancer and want to fight it because of his fight against cancer. How beautiful it would be if that guy is above suspicion. And I've interviewed him and looked him straight in the eye and <clears throat> I said to Ron, I'm almost ashamed of it. I wrote maybe 2,000 words on the interview and I asked him all the tough questions at the end of which I went away and I thought, he's not corrupt, or at least if he is, we don't know it. He might be the exception to the rule. He might be superhuman because of his fight against cancer. So I wrote my story verbatim with what he and I said. And at the end of it, I put one line saying, I hope I'm right. And I just thought, how cowardly is that, you, you know, as a writer, to sit on the fence. And what I was doing was just in case somebody had some evidence, you, you know, around the corner from, from where I was sitting. And we, we talked about this at lunchtime. It's dreadful that he's the policeman, I'm the journalist. And it seems from this discussion so far that I'm the one who's more suspicious than he is. Okay, I just want to make the record clear here. <laughs> I was talking about a sport, not one particular event. And since you've disclosed our confidential lunch conversation, um, this is where, I mean, he's very, he's very smart, very experienced, De and, a, and a great writer. And he said, Ron, everything on stage is on the record. Let's have lunch before and we can go over the various topics that we're going to discuss. I didn't ask him whether everything at lunch was on the record, and now I see it is on the record. And, and, and since I didn't say it was off the record, I'm now confessing. I couldn't, I couldn't leave these people wondering yeah. what it was. Yeah. So what, with the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency and Interpol and law enforcement and a number of countries, we're really trying to come up with a program to help assure people that sponsor cycling, that support cycling, that are honest cycling cyclists that don't take dope, that the sport isn't filled with nothing but dopers at the highest level. And that's something, it's, it's something we're embarking on. It's going to be a tough, tough, tough mountain to climb or road to climb, but it's a sport that I think most reasonable people will say there have been so many um, allegations and so many athletes who've had their championships taken away from them because they were found to have used drugs, sports, enha sports enhancing drugs, performance enhancing drugs, that I think it's fair to say that that's a, a high risk area. And that's an area that I want to focus on. I don't feel the same way about football, just to draw a parallel. And what the goal has to be is to make sure that football never gets to the point where no matter what the match is, no matter what the result is, we can't have confidence in it. And that's why we're working um, towards it. And I'm a very suspicious person by nature and professionally. But in this role with FIFA, we're trying to do prevention, not just prosecution and conviction. So I'm, I'm, tr I'm also a law professor, so I'm trying to think about it, not in terms of everyone's guilty or suspicious, but they're doing things that could cause suspicion, seem unusual, and we need to find out whether or not they're honest. Or not. Since, since the Secretary General of Interpol has reached a high note instead of some of the suspicious stuff we've been talking about, we have six minutes left, so let's throw it open to the, to the floor if anybody's got specific questions, please. Okay. So they're going to have a microphone so that they can record it. 
I don't want you to be influenced what I'm going to ask you now, but could you please state your name and the organization that you're with before asking me a question? Okay, my name is Vlash. That shouldn't, influ that shouldn't influence the question you ask me at all. All right. Okay? Uh, my name is Vlash. I'm working for the Daily Millet newspaper, so I told you that you're going to guess what I'm going to ask as a Turkish journalist. I'm going to ask that, you know, the Turkish football is under a big corruption since um, the July. And uh, FIFA has an alert system which is implied last year or two years ago. Did you get any news from that alert news, you know, of the alerts before that corruption uh, things and the match fixing, um, telephone tapes and other stuff? That's so, so our relationship with FIFA is in the area of prevention and capacity building and training. The, the alert system they have is something that would have gone to the head of security in FIFA and you'd have to ask the head of security in FIFA what he knew or what they knew and when they knew it. I don't have that information, I'm sorry. All right. And I just want to ask, second question is, um, do you have any information or do you have give any brief information about the case going on with FIFA, UEFA and the Turkish Football Federation? No. Okay, thank you. If this were not being recorded, I would say the briefing is going to happen after this press conference. Okay, teasing, teasing, teasing. Okay, thank you. Welcome, sir. Okay, nice to see you here. I would like to ask question in English, but I prefer to ask question to be Turkish. Uh, there is a question. Now is I am uh, asking to be Turkish. E, şike sizin yüksek tecrübelerinize göre sahada mı aranmalı yoksa saha dışında mı aranmalı? Teknik olarak şike sahada mı aranmalı saha dışında mı aranmalı yoksa her ikisi bir arada mı aranmalı? Teşekkür ediyorum. The question is do we have to look for match fixing on the pitch or outside the pitch or both together and the answer is both together. Do, do we have a question from, from the business? Sorry. Yeah, they, they, need, they need your need a microphone here. Sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask whether there have been any approaches to you on the education plan with Interpol vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. Have there been any approaches? Are you taking any stand toward Turkey? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. W Thank we, you. we are in discussions with Turkey. The important point was for us to not have unnecessary media attention uh, occur. If now I were to have discussions with Turkey about prevention, people would be at, people would think I'm having discussions with Turkey about their investigation. So the discussions are have begun, and, and we are very hopeful that they will they will lead to something productive. Anybody else? Uh, Jonathan Duff of PPR. Um, I don't know quite how to articulate this question, but uh, Rob was talking about maybe lowering the threshold of a particularly demanding event like the Tour de France. But, I mean, if you say it's not 30 days, it's 20 days, do you really think that's going to make a lot of difference? It isn't, and, and I don't know if it's a sort of supplementary question, isn't there just so much money at stake? Not just prize money, sponsorship, career, etc. That your job as Secretary General of Interpol is almost impossible to um, <laughs> to prevent or even you know prosecute uh, a fraction of what might be going on illegally. So I believe that I believe that on, on the prevention side, that uh, the job any of us have to try to prevent um, people from being corruptly influenced in athletic activities, I don't think that's a really hard job. But I think the beginning part of your question um, is really the problem. That is, there reaches a point where there's so much money involved um, in an activity that when something unusual or something bad happens, there is the tendency not 
to expose it. There's a tendency to say we can't expose this because if we do, it's going to cost us our future, the sport's going to suffer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that the, wor the, the alternative is worse. If you don't take care of it, you're going to reach the point where no one has any confidence. And although you might have been high in terms of your revenue generation in point A or year one or year two, eventually it's going to fall. So in business, in life, we believe that if you, if you lead a good life, if you have a good relationship with your customers, if you produce good products, in the long run, you're going to succeed. It's getting to the long run. That's a challenge. And I believe it's a mixture of prevention cases where you investigate and prosecute, like it's happening in Turkey, where no one's above the law from the highest to the lowest, and then back home with the family and the community to try to remind people that it's a beautiful activity, athletics, sports, and we should try to keep it clean. One more then, please. Hi, thank you. Brian Christilakis from the European Capital of Sport magazine. I just had a question you mentioned uh, before about all global climate, uh, crime is also local crime. It's occurring somewhere. And I was just wondering, is there any correlation demographically between sort of the level of development of a particular community or country and corruption and you know, match setting or anything like that? And as countries, for example, look at the, the BRICS countries, you know, we have those developing countries that everybody's watching at the moment. As they develop further, does that mean there's, there's more crime in sport, or does that mean there's less crime in sport, or is there any correlation? There's no correlation that I've seen between wealthy and poor in terms of corruption. There is correlation between the way in which illegal activity occurs based on economic development. So for example, as more people get connected to internet, we see more internet-related crime. Doesn't mean that, that, the, that, that the criminal um, conduct is related to development, but the means for achieving it. Now, I've you know, corrupt people at all levels, races, gender, nationalities, wealth, education, everything. Um, and that's why it's such a huge, huge undertaking. But that's why I say it gets back to the local nation, community, family. OK, that basically is the end of our time. So you're all released from custody to go and have some <laughs> refreshment and then join Juventus and here get get back on track with marketing and uh, principles of business. Thank could could I much. could I could I just ask a question? As a law professor, I know easy questions to ask. So if I'm going to ask this question, hands will go up or they won't go up. But it'd be an easy question. How many people here believe tonight Real Madrid will qualify for the finals? <laughs> just 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 raise your hands. Just raise your hands. Okay, about 25%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.